Ambassador designer Aditi Mershid, Ambassador to Kuwait, Foreign Minister's Special Envoy to Middle East, and former Senior Minister of State for Foreign Affairs at Free Republic of Singapore. Professor Tan Tayong, Director of the Institute of South Asian Studies, and nominated Member of Parliament, distinguished, distinguished guest of Varina Nafari. Soon to be announced a member of Parliament of the Government. Yeah. That's what I appreciate. It'd be formally sworn in in just a few minutes. <laughs> On behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies, ISA, I warmly welcome you to this afternoon's book launch and panel discussion on the publication Being Muslim in South Asia Diversity and Daily Life. The book is co, um, co edited by ISA senior researchers Professor Robin Jeffrey and Dr. Ron Johnson. I now invite Professor Tan Tayong to deliver the opening remarks. Professor Tan, please. Thank you very much, Sitara. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you, and welcome to this afternoon's uh, book launch. This is the second event that ISS has organized today. We had a talk this morning by uh, the politician and scholar, the Kendra Yada, uh, which was very well attended. And I'm very pleased to see that despite this being a Friday, uh, there are still uh, a good number of people who come to listen to uh, ISS events, and this is a good sign. Um, I want to begin by thanking and congratulating my colleagues, uh, uh, Robin Jeffrey and Ronald Joy Sen, for uh, bringing out this important volume, which started live actually as a conversation, I think, in one of our uh, morning meetings, when uh, the, uh, our chairman ambassador, Dr. Nafili, suggested that it would be a good idea for ISS to do a volume like this to look at the uh, Muslim communities in South Asia. And arising from that suggestion, uh, Robin and Ronald Joy carefully took up the challenge, organized a workshop, brought in a number of good scholars, uh, including our, our, our own in, in, in ISIS, and then brought up this uh, very important volume. So uh, I want to thank them for their efforts and also for their um, ability to bring together such uh, an interesting collection of essays uh, together. Now, this volume attests to the range of interest that ISAS has, and um, many of you may think that what we do are essentially um, cold hard economics or international relations, but ISAS has interest beyond that, and we are very interested to look at social political developments uh, across uh, South Asia, not just in one country, but how uh, these phenomena are seen and experienced in different countries as well. So this book on, South, uh, on the Muslim communities in South Asia um, shows our ability to cover uh, developments across the entire region. And we also hope that such studies would have resonance and um, relevance to uh, developments in Singapore and Southeast Asia. And uh, I'm very pleased uh, that uh, we are able to uh, invite our uh, guest of honor and best friend, Rashid, to grace this occasion because he would be the best person uh, to share with us how such a topic um, does not only have uh, isolated relevance in South Asia, but how it would also have relevance in Southeast Asia as well. So it is my uh, honor and pleasure to welcome our guest of honor, Ambassador Sainal Sabin Rashid, and as Sitara has introduced, our ambassador to Kuwait and also special envoy to the Middle East. Uh, and uh, I will now invite uh, Ambassador Rashid to uh, make his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Tan Taiwan. Professor Tan, um, in fact, we see some of my gurus here too, actually. Professor Ria Sassan was a lecturer when I was a student on campus. And, uh, of course, I'm in my And, uh, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon, and uh, welcome to this uh, event. Before I begin proper, I thought uh, maybe congratulations are due to Professor Tan Taliong for having been announced as our one of the new uh, nominated member of parliament as an MP. So I'm sure we all can expect a more spicy, you not know, hot debate in parliament. <laughs> yeah. um, this subject about Muslims in South Asia, in fact Muslims all over the world, uh, particularly Muslim minorities, have been of great interest to me personally. And I'm sure that this is a topic which is uh, also of great importance, not only Singapore, but also to the region and to the world. For those of you who actually were party to this 
this uh, workshop we, which we had in 2011. It's like a part two uh, of this uh, series. And I'm looking forward to part three, which I'll share with you later on. Um, it is worth, of course, remembering that uh, of all the Muslims in the world, more than a third live in the countries of South Asia, including, of course, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, and Maldives. And for those of you who still remember the workshop, I shared with you my conversation uh, over a meal with uh, the former Prime Minister of India, Mr. Man Mohan Singh. This was after discussion I had with uh, Professor Nizami of Oxford University. And I was telling Professor Nizami how much, in fact, uh, there is a need for us to understand Muslims in India in particular, one of the largest minorities in the world. And uh, they have a lot to contribute in terms of our understanding Muslims and Muslim minorities in particular in this very turbulent and dynamic world. And I shared that conversation with uh, Mr. Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. I think uh, you all know, I think Manmohan Singh is uh, very low profile. He didn't say much. But uh, I wish there would be another opportunity for him to meet another Prime Minister and this time is the Modi. And uh, it'll be very interesting, I'm sure, to discuss about Muslims in India with Mr. Modi. I met him during the Gujarat summit when I visited, when I was uh, then still the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs of India. And uh, this was after the controversial backdrop which Mr. Modi was involved in. So meeting him, I thought, was very interesting. And uh, he's a lot more uh, interactive and it was quite an engaging uh, conversation we had. I look forward to another conversation with him if I get the opportunity, especially uh, as Prime Minister of India, the new India. I think some of you may have attended the Singapore seminar on uh, in Singapore, Singapore and India, and the way forward. I think we can see a lot we can expect there. Well, you heard just now from Professor Tan Taiyong about how this idea of the uh, workshop and the book finally germinated. And I think we all know Professor Gopi. I didn't realize that he had his uh, Friday morning sessions. I used to have what I call Friday blessings when I was editor of Rita Harida. Every Friday afternoon. So we used to gather and then share ideas. So this kind of uh, sessions, uh, you can never know what come up of those sessions. And I'm glad that uh, Professor, uh, Mr. Gopi was uh, contribu uh, contributed to this germination of the idea for the workshop and now this book. Of course, he was not alone in his enthusiasm for learning about Muslim life and salvation today and for bringing together leading scholars to study societies and cultures in the region. The workshop in September 2011 uh, was an occasion where more than a dozen scholars from seven different countries participated. Papers were produced for the workshop, and these were later revised, and few other scholars were asked to join in the project. And the manuscript for this book was then steadily pieced together at ISS. And Oxford University Press in New Delhi readily accepted the manuscript for publication. And the book we are launching today is the result. The book represents another example of the commitment of Singapore and NUS to the serious study of South Asia in all its dimensions. When you have the opportunity to look at the book, I hope you will agree with me that it is a notable and welcome, a welcome volume. The subtitle, Diversity and Daily Life, is uh, just as uh, interesting, if not telling. As the editors have suggested, too often in the past 15 years, mention of Muslim or Islam, especially in the West, has been in connection with violence and uh, dislocation. I suppose more so even today with what we have in the IS or ISIS and the controversies that uh, surround them. I'm glad that more and more Muslim leaders and Muslim organizations are coming up uh, forthrightly denouncing them and rejecting their ideology and their philosophy because this 
yes, it seems to be very, very contrary to what we Muslims believe in. Muslims have come to be portrayed as enemies of civilization rather than as creators of one of the great civilizations of human history. As the eminent historian, I hope that I got his pronunciation correct, Henri Pirin, showed many years ago in his book, Muhammad and uh, Charlemagne, Islam and the rise of the West were intimately entwined. Without Muhammad, Pirin stated, there would have been no Charlemagne. This book attempts to refocus the lens by examining a range of activities and preoccupations the re that engage the region's 500 million Muslims, the largest concentration of Muslims in the world. The ACES provide insights into similarities and diversities of Islamic thought and practice, as well as into the life experiences of South Asian Muslims in all its richness. By closely studying aspects of life in Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, and Sri Lanka, the essays in the book demonstrate that there are diverse ways to be Muslim. This is very true in fact all over the world. Practices may differ. The customs and concerns of Muslims on the east coast of Sri Lanka are different from those of Bangladesh. We take two examples from the book. But devotion to the Holy Quran and the fundamental principles of Islam are shared. The essays in the book range widely and capture aspects of social, economic, and cultural life. And for example, they follow the spread of communities like the Kojas to East Africa and around the world. This is again a very interesting part of the book. Whether it's about the Kojas in East Africa or the Ismailis, you can see the influence of the Indians or, or the South Asians in various parts of the world, and especially so in this part of the world of South Asia. I'll come to that later on when I talk about maybe part three of this project. <laughs> and it showed how that global community attempts to cope with the legal questions of being devout and highly mobile people in the modern world. There are essays on media, education, political ideas, and even sports. Sports fans are catered for in an essay on the famous football team, Mohammedan Sporting Club of Calcutta. It's interesting they include this article too. This is this precedes the World Cup, or is it because of the World Cup? I'm not sure. But I remember, in fact, there's a group in Singapore called the Muhammadan Starlight Group. And uh, when I mentioned this to Johnson, he is so on the ball, I tell you. <laughs> and he immediately, the next day, or in fact, the same day, he sent me an email with a reproduction of some uh, cutting, news cutting of a uh, meeting held in Singapore by the Mohammedan Starlight Club. And they had an AGM. And looking at the number, at the names of officials in that club, it says a lot about, again, South Asians being active even here in this part of the world. Although not much for cricket, but football, more football than cricket. So you can see that, you know, we are also rich in our research material, and I think it's a lot we can work on to produce that part three I'm talking about. So it is appropriate that a book like this should be assembled in Singapore. Singapore for hundreds of years has been, has, has been a meeting place for trade, not merely in goods, but in ideas. This region along the Straits of Malacca has also been a center of interaction for Muslims since the first traders and religious teachers arrived here more than a thousand years ago. Studies show that nearly 20% of Singapore Muslims are descendants of people of South Asia. That's quite a significant number. The most common inter-ethnic marriages in Singapore are between South Asian Muslims and Malays. South Asian Islam has infused the practice of culture of Singapore Muslims profoundly, and such influences are to be seen everywhere, in cuisine, Islamic Jubilee, you know, and in names of and, and in names and in places of worship. Today, for example, if I may just uh, show you, when I was reading the Brita Haryan, there were two pages of articles. One is actually about P.I. Hassan, P.I. Hassan Ahmad. And uh, sounds very Indonesian, right? P.I. and Hassan. But it, actually, he, he was born in Singapore, but his father was born, guess where, in Palekat. You, 
heard of Kai Polika, the sorrow of his regret. And his father was born in, in, in Polika, in India. And um, the name of his father was Ahmad Sina Vapumayan. A very Indian name. And uh, he went, of course, came to Singapore and then went on to Surabaya Bandu. He's better known as Hassan Bandu. And uh, today, in fact, uh, his contribution and story to this part of the world, not only Singapore, but Indonesia, and uh, Nusantara, uh, they put, uh, included it in a book produced by the, by the Religious Teachers Association, which was just uh, launched. Another example, not so uh, friendly and not so positive, is about the case of uh, ISIS and the influence of South Indian Muslim leaders on Singaporean. And this person, by the name of Akhuddin, was influenced by a Ghul Muhammad Maraikan. Another Maraikan. I'm not <coughs> sure what's the link, but um, Muhammad Mar Ghul Muhammad Maraikan was from India, came to Singapore, and influenced Akhuddin to uh, want to be part of the ISIS agenda. And some of them have even gone to join battles in Syria and uh, in Iraq. So this again shows, in fact, the influence of South Indians, uh, South, uh, South Asians rather, in, in this part of the world. And it's a very rich area, which I thought maybe ISIS should also look into as part three to see the influence of South Asians in Singapore and how part of the world. And only yesterday, in fact, when I was interviewed by my history channel in Malaysia on the Sultan Mosque in Singapore, I was relating the history of Sultan Mosque. The Sultan Mosque you see today is a very is part two. You know, it's a very a rebuilt of the old mosque. And but the old mosque built by the Sultan um, was actually a replica of uh, Nusantara architecture, very Indonesian. But that replica was of another mosque in Malacca called Masjid India. Masjid India in Malacca, Masjid India, Masjid Kling in India, uh, in Malacca, and uh, but it had a very uh, Nusantara architecture. So you can imagine again how rich the influence of one on another, and how in fact it's gone on to uh, be very much alive today. And uh, the Sultan Mosque of today, if you see it, is, you will notice that among members who are appointed to the board of trustees, two must be North Indian and two must be South Indians. But they also have, of course, two Bugis, two Banjaris, and two uh, Bug, uh, two Bugis, two Banjaris, and Javanese. So two South Indian and two North Indian. So again, uh, another living example of how rich uh, the influence of South Asians have been on Singapore and our part of the world here. And I look forward to part three of ISS playing its very dynamic and active role. So on that note, uh, it's a pleasure for me to launch this book and to bring it to attention not only of Singaporeans, but to any global citizen wishing to better understand the diversity and daily lives of more than 500 million people, Muslims of South Asia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before I officially launch the book, I invite Professor Robin Jeffrey to give an introduction to the publication. Professor, please. My, I should explain that my role in this has been largely administrative. When uh, our chairman, Mr. Gopinath Pillai, makes a suggestion, his wishes are commands. So <laughs> members of ISIS at once leap to attention. No, it's been a great pleasure to work on this project, particularly with Ramajoy, because we found we get on very well and seem to be able to call on a wide range of different sorts of people and to use our various levers of influence to get work out of uh, a range of contributors. What we've been able to do is, I think, and I should hold up the book because you really do need to, if I may borrow sure. that one, um, you really do need to have a look at what it, what it looks like. I gather there'll be some copies outside to look at later. Um, there's, there are 15, uh, there are 16 authors, in fact, in the book from, I think, eight different countries. There are four from Australia, but in mitigation, I can say all the Australians have a strong Singapore connection to try to. Uh, you know, um, dilute the Australianness of their otherwise <laughs> too informal and too noisy presence. Um, the, uh, there are two based in Singapore, two from Pakistan, two from Bangladesh, two from India, that's all 
very equitable and getting over any notion of great power chauvinism being at work here. Two from the United States, one from the United Kingdom, and one from Germany. And they're also, what I think is nice about the book, there are a range of ability, uh, not abilities, but of ages and levels of distinction. Um, Khalid Ahmed Massoud, who is probably the most distinguished intellectual historian of South Asian Islam alive today, is in the book from Pakistan, along with Barbara Metcalf and Professor Ria Hassan. These are three of the elder statespersons of this kind of study. But at the other end, there are people beginning their careers. We heard only today that one of our contributors, a very nice man called Tanvir Fazl, who's just moved to Johar Al Nehru University, he received this week his first book, which has come out from Routledge, called Nation, State, and Minority Rights in India. So he's well on the way to uh, a productive academic career, and will, you know, one has to hope, become a friend of ISIS in the long term. It helps to extend that ISIS network. Every time ISIS has a workshop, uh, the network is extended a little bit farther, and it means that this Singapore reach goes even deeper into other parts of the world. Um, that's the point I would make about the book, and um, about the Institute, that it does have a wonderful ability to tap global networks, which grows every year. Uh, now, partly, I think that's a result of being in Singapore, because Singapore is the great crossroads of the 21st century. It's the uh, Suez Canal of the 21st century. Somebody said to me the other day that Changi Airport is a puritanical Port Said. You know, Port Said in the old days was uh, the place where the world met and got up to all sorts of naughtiness. But Changi, the world meets, but it's all terribly You can take your maiden aunt to Changi without any shame and embarrassment. Um, but it does make it very easy to bring interesting and outstanding people together for the kind of workshop that produced this book. Producing a book like this does become easier with, when you're in Singapore because people like to come from Singapore, particularly from the Asian region, but they like to come to Singapore from all over the world, I think. And ISIS as an institution makes all of that possible and it makes it very uh, straightforward to run fruitful workshops. And to such workshops create a momentum that then allows you to continue the year's work that goes into pulling together the papers from a, work, uh, a workshop and creating a book out of them. Uh, part of the reason is that ISIS has ex always has excellent administrative staff. So you get support here of an administrative kind that you couldn't hope to get in an Australian institution. I don't know, I can't speak about it. I've not worked for a long time in other places in the world, but certainly in Australia, couldn't hope to get the kind of administrative support that we get here. On this particular project, Rana Joy and I were particularly fortunate because as a research associate, somebody who worked with us on the, the project, we had Pradima Singh, who was an outstanding young woman working here, who seems to have been taken by aliens and has vanished into the United Kingdom in the last year and a half, but maybe they'll give her back at some stage. Um, the other great advantage of this book, and I would, if you pick it up, do have a look. There are some very nice maps in the book, drawn specially for the book, by Mrs. Lee Kenny, who is in the cartography department at uh, NUS, or in the geography department. Uh, she's their cartographer. And again, it's one of those rare privileges of being here that you have that kind of expert talent to draw on. You can take Mrs. Uh, Lee uh, a map and say, this is sort of what I want, but I want these features on it too, and I want that kind of a projection. So, yeah, yeah, can, can and then just choose your way, tells you to go away. And a week later, you get a lovely base map that you can then make changes on. And eventually, as I hope you'll agree if you have a look at the book, the, the maps are really quite an attractive feature of the book, and they put some data forward that otherwise aren't necessarily internalized in people's heads. But when you see them uh, prepared in this graphic way, they make an impact that mere numbers on a page can't do. Um, the, uh, and I should say, too, that at Oxford University Press in Delhi, we worked with a, a young woman called Pawani Sangupta, who is an editor there. And again, we were treated very well. She's a relentless and very, very persevering and careful kind of editor, which one doesn't always uh, attract when one's doing a book with a publisher who's taking through the press probably 70, 80, 90 books in any one month. Uh, Pawani was outstanding in the way she attended to detail. So, 
I don't think you'll find a lot of, a lot of telegraphic errors in this book. I think it's been fairly carefully looked at by a number of caring eyes. Um, the other aspect of the book that goes with that production are some of the photographs. There, most of I think the illustrated chapters are is that one by Dennis McGilroy, who's an American anthropologist who's worked for 40 years in Sri Lanka, um, and he's got a fascinating chapter on marriage practices in amongst Muslims on the east coast of Sri Lanka. But they're also illustrated with some of his own very fine photography. And this photo provides the cover of the book. Again, OGP have done a nice job, I think, in seeing that those were reproduced to do them justice, to do fine photographs justice. Um, anyway, we hope, too, that you'll enjoy hearing from three of the authors of papers in the book, Arif and Riaz and Ranajoy. Each one will bring like, their own personal perspectives to the book and, or, and to the conversation that you'll have as a panel discussion. Um, their perspectives, I think, are also interestingly complementary. That uh, there's a wonderful Singapore connection through Riaz, there's a global one through Arif, and then there's just plain lovely football one through Manitou. So with that, uh, let me thank the ambassador for agreeing to do this one. She was, as uh, Tayong said, by far the most appropriate person we could have hoped to have here today. And we're very grateful to her for, for coming. Um, and, and doing such a nice job on the launch. Well, he hasn't launched it yet, so we shouldn't compliment him, I suppose. But I'll invite him, if I may, to launch the book. And launching the book uh, seems to involve pulling a ribbon. I think that's the process. Let's swing it Yes, Nothing was And we have the co-editors of the book from Robin Jeffrey and Dr. Well Jackson to join the launch. We would also like to thank other co authors from Roy Sassan and Dr. Ari Jamal to join us. Take for taking please, Dr. Uh, I've been delegated the uh, pleasant task of being the chairperson for this uh, occasion. And what we've asked our three panelists to do, and Ambassador Zendel has agreed to stay on and be part of the panel, what we'll hear is from the three contributors, as I said earlier, from their perspectives on each of the chapters. And we're going to go from Singapore to the world and then back to serious matters of football in Kolkata to finish with, and then we'll have a, a short question and answer session, uh, which uh, will probably lead us to finishing about uh, half past four or thereabouts, I think, and then there'll be a tea session afterwards. So without further ado, will I ask, uh, let me ask uh, Professor Riaz Hassan to talk a little bit about his contribution to the book, but also his own very special relationship with Islam in South Asia and with Singapore especially. Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, first of all, let me also add my thanks to uh, for, for, uh, for inviting me to be part of the symposium that led to this uh, book. Uh, I think, as the ambassador has said, uh, South Asia is probably now home to the largest concentration of Muslims in the world. One of every three Muslims now live in South Asia. And rather paradoxically, South Asia does not really receive, South Asian Islam does not receive the kind of attention it should receive. And a great deal of discussion is focused on the Middle East. I think it needs to be many <coughs> So the first uh, thing that I'd like to highlight, and it's not just my essay, I'm pleased to see that other essays have talked about it, is the legal voice and the way in which this legal voice or this legal articulation is taking place. The other aspect is really about the internationalization. Robin uh, kind of flattered me by saying there was a global perspective, but it is this sort of sense of internationalization. And an internationalization or a global perspective that is cutting in two ways. South Asia is famous for a diaspora, uh, whether that diaspora is in Southeast Asia or in any other parts of the world. Uh, that, to use the Singapore phrase, Indian Muslim uh, 
uh, community, Indian Muslim in the you know, global sense of you know, South Asian Muslim, perhaps you might say. But that diaspora now is embedded in many parts of the world. It is there of long standing, and it is expressing itself in its own way. And it is also now no longer, I think, a purely uh, derivative diaspora. It's also contributing in its own voice. So conversations are going in both directions. As that happens, there are there uh, new dynamics which are coming about, and particularly when some of those communities might be connected internationally and globally. And I gave the example of a community that is institutionally connected internationally and globally, but there are others which are connected simply by ways, of, by means of communication, uh, which is enabling these conversations to happen. Um, we, we mentioned this Islamic State group now, it was a little bit, and of course it's uh, was an event about the uh, murder of an American journalist recently, it's very sad, it's, you know, what they kept reporting was it was a British accent, and it's probably uh, a British Muslim or Pakistani accent. Uh, that did this, um, and I was watching the British news to see the reactions there about it. And of course, they've been going to these mosques and they're saying, you know, one of the problems is, the leaders of the mosques have been saying, one of the problems is, of course, our young British Muslims, Pakistani, uh, Pakistani descent, are alienated even from the earlier generations. Why? Because they don't have access to good news. So these dynamics are happening in very complex ways. And all of this uh, just brings me to the third point that I wanted to make, which I think is reflected, uh, I hope is reflected in my essay, but you know, uh, Riaz had mentioned it in, uh, more eloquently. Whenever I'm in his presence, I always feel remarkably unerudite. Um, so I'm just going to try and say uh, things as best as I can, but uh, there's the master. Uh, and it's, it's a tribute to the editors and to the to the volume that they put together, that they chose to concentrate on being Muslim and recognizing that that being can be taking place in different ways, and that they chose to put the word diversity. Because this diversity, uh, in its daily expression, as well as in its more uh, intellectual, legal, and other voices, is fundamentally important. The challenge, uh, I always kind of distinguish uh, between these two things the fact of the plurality, which I think is undeniable, and the challenge of embracing an ethic of pluralism or not. Uh, that, I think, is one of the things that the book uh, raises for us. And so I hope uh, for those that will have a chance to look at it, that will be a useful contribution there. Thank you. Thank you. And George will ask you to wind up the back of the room instead of uh, not the night watchman, not the tail end. Find me a metaphor. Yeah, I guess we have to find a footballing metaphor. Yes, a footballing metaphor. I'm going to do that. Just uh, very briefly speak on my essay. We'll sort of do that subtitle deals with the daily life aspect uh, of, of uh, being Muslim in South Asia. And it's perhaps no accident that the book, uh, the, the essay is the last uh, uh, chapter of the book, probably reflects the sort of marginal presence of, of sport in the academy, uh, despite the enormous presence of sport in many of our lives. So there is a sort of black there. Um, but I also must mention that this is a, a small part of a book manuscript on, on the social history of sport in India that I've just finished and is with the publisher, and you will see the light of day soon. So um, I have some, I have some um, visuals to sort of enlighten up this evening. So when we speak about sport in India, uh, one of the iconic events is a victory by this team, the Mohan Bagan team, the Kalkara team, which beat a British regimental team playing barefoot. And this was in 1911 in one of the, uh, the premier tournaments of the time, the I for Sheep. This event has been iconized, in, especially in Bengal. Films, a film has been made, and there's another one, I believe, in the pipeline. But what is often forgotten is another story, the story of Mohammedan Sporting Club, which actually won the Calcutta League, uh, which is also a prestigious uh, tournament of the time, five times on the trot from 1934 to 1939. Uh, the club was uh, founded in 1891, so it goes back a long way. 
uh, in fact, it predates the Indian Muslim League. And it had three earlier reincarnations, and the uh, Northern Sporting Club was actually the third name of the club. The earlier names, I think, one was Hamidia, the other was Crescent, and finally they, they fixed on Northern Sporting Club. Uh, the picture here uh, is of Jast Justice Syed Amir Ali, uh, a Muslim notable at the time, of course, the judge, after whom a prominent street in Calcutta is named today. And why I have this picture is because the first meeting of the Northern Sporting Club was held in Justice uh, Amir Ali's house. And it wasn't so unusual that Calcutta was the site for the formation of Muslim Club because Calcutta was really where a lot of reaction was happening in terms of, 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 of uh, Muslim intellectuals in India, and Amir Ali was one of them. Uh, but the club gets, you know, in initial years, you know, is, is, is really a fledgling organization, not you know, too prominent. But in the 30s, uh, it, it really had its, uh, its successful run. And I mentioned that you know, between 34 to 30, and this is 1934, Mahmoud very grainy picture. But uh, a couple of things should be noted. You know, why Mahmoud's voting was suddenly so successful? Uh, one of the reasons was, you know, Mahmoud Sporting, unlike the other club that I mentioned, Mahmoud or the other uh, clubs that had come up in the meanwhile, could draw on, on it had a catchment area which was pan Indian in scope. So it had players not only from Calcutta, but actually it could import players from far afield as Quetta, Lahore, and you know, deep down south from, you know, from, from Karnataka. So it was really a pan Indian team, but uh, comprised entirely of Muslims. The second reason was that you know, because you know, Muslim notables like Amir Ali and you know, the others who followed him uh, you know, contributed heavily to the cause of Mahatma Sporting, and it was in a fairly healthy financial situation which enabled it to draw on these on resources to, to, to recruit uh, nationally. And finally, and perhaps you know, this is the most important in footballing terms, and I did mention that Mahatma Gandhi played very fit. Uh, when we beat the regimental team, and most Indian teams actually continued to play, uh, play their team, including the Indian team which went to the Olympics, the first Olympics in, you know, after India became independent in 1948. The Indian team too is playing their feet, which was uh, unthinkable for the, for the foreign team. But Mohammed Sporting was the first Indian team to actually play in books. So there was a good, solid footballing reason for their, for their success too. And uh, these books were sort of specially designed by one of the coaches uh, made in Calcutta, and, and that was, um, uh, 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 was definitely one of the reasons for the success. Uh, this is, uh, again, a very green picture of one of the uh, Mohammed Sporting stars from the 1930s, a man called Salim, who had a fairly extraordinary story. Uh, you know, he was a star in, in Calcutta Maidan, but then, along with a friend, he made a trip to Scotland of all places. You know, why he made a trip to Scotland, no one really knows. But uh, one of the, he tried out for one of the famous teams, the football fans are familiar with Celtic, uh, uh, one of the premier you know, Scottish teams. He tried out and actually played two matches for them, where he scored several goals and dazzled them. But in the end, Salim decided to come back, and we really don't know why he decided to come back, but we do know that he went to Scotland, tried out, played a couple of games, and then he was back. But Salim wasn't the only, only star. Here we have a picture of one of another Mahmoud sporting star in 1930s, again part of that winning team, Juma Khan, who actually featured in ads uh, inserted by the Indian Tea Board. It was then known as the Tea Expansion Board. And it's interesting that you know, a couple of Mahmoud sporting, uh, Juma Khan wasn't the only one. There was another player called Noor Muhammad who also featured in ads. And these ads predated ads in which Indian cricket stars appear. So because you know the, the, the stereotype is that cricket is the South Asian sport, and that's of course true to a great extent. But Jumna Khan and Noor Muhammad were actually featuring in keyboard ads well before you know, the then Indian cricket star CK Naidu, Bernard CK Naidu, the captain, the first captain of the cricket team, uh, <laughs> was featuring ads. So CK Naidu actually appears in ads only from the 1940s for I think a liver tonic if I'm not wrong. And, and these these ads in the uh, we must also remember there's a political dimension to this whole thing, so story episode. And the 1930s was a highly communally charged uh, 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 a decade. 
and the Muslim uh, the, the, the government of West Bengal was uh, a coalition between Muslim and the Krishak Praja Party, which was a uh, Bengal party. And the, 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 these politics often spilled over onto the football pitch of the Maidan. This is just a sort of rudimentary map of you know, the, the uh, communal situation in the 1930s. You would see a lot of violent incidents happening in what is now Bangladesh, what was then East Bengal. Calcutta is not part of it, but there were several such incidents in happening in Calcutta too. And these events were reflected on the football pitch, and in between 1937 to 1939, there were several incidents where there was violence off the pitch following a mountain sporting victory, when people were killed, you know, riots happened. And this uh, also played out in the politics, in, in the politics that was happening in Bengal and elsewhere. Uh, you know, Mohammed Sporting Club was, was one element of, of you know, communism or the religious sentiments being there on, on, on the uh, playground. Uh, this is a picture of, from the uh, perhaps quite famous for you know, people who are interested in sport, the uh, quadrangular cricket tournament in Bombay, which later became pentangular, where actual teams represented one religious community. So you had the Hindus, then the Muslims, and then you had the Europeans. And then there was an other category which comprised of you know, Parsis, uh, Christians, and Indians. So this is another team, the 1934 Muslim cricket team, which actually won that year. And these were you know, serious contests and you know, watched by several thousand spectators. Uh, the interesting about the, 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 the quadrangular, which later became the pentangular, was that even though it was enormously popular, the Indian National Congress was uh, against it from the 1920s, 30s, for obvious reasons. They thought this sort of deviated from the composite in secular nationalism that they, they, they stood for. And there was a famous sort of instance where Gandhi uh, was called upon to sort of intervene by uh, a nationalist uh, to stop this tournament. And Gandhi in 1939 did make a statement saying that the Indians should be concerned about other things than playing cricket with um, the teams representing different religions. That didn't actually stop the tournament, and the tournament continued. But the tournament eventually ended after uh, India and Pakistan became in uh, And a final couple of things. This is uh, just to note that you know, my uh, chapter kind of ends with the story of Martin 1447, although I have a sort of conclusion when I dwell briefly on, on the, the afterlife of Martin 1447. It still exists. It's still existing. Club, it still has a team. <coughs> and so this is a picture of the entrance to the Mohammed Sporting Club off one of the major arterial roads in Calcutta, the, the Red Road. Um, you know, the, its fortunes dipped after 47 for various reasons. And many of the players, administrators left for either Pakistan or, or, or then East Pakistan and subsequently Bangladesh. Um, but one of the interesting things was that you know, even in the 50s, the team comprised mostly Muslims, but from the late 50s and 60s, the team became far more uh, you know, uh, uh, diverse in nature. So uh, in the early 1980s, in this picture of the, the, the kind of support that they still put Ghana, the Mahmoud team was really, had fewer Muslims played for it than non-Muslims. And in the 80s, um, and this is the, sort of the last one I'm going to make, is it was, the team was bankrolled by a, a, a prominent Calcutta uh, Muslim businessman, and it managed to like, attract a lot of star players from the other island teams like Mohan Bagan and the other great Calcutta team, East Bengal. And when they won the 1981 Calcutta League after a gap, I think, of 15 or 20 years, they had the team actually, I think, had only two Muslims. And one of the prominent news magazines at the time, Sunday, actually headlined the story of the victory saying that eight Brahmins bring, you know, the Calcutta League to Mahmoud Sporting. So not only were the Hindus playing in the Mahmoud Sporting team, it actually had eight Brahmins playing for the team. So in that sense, the, the composition, the attitude of the team has changed radically. And, and that's something that probably is, is the, should be the agenda to research for some uh, future research. Thank you.